I'm so glad you're with us here on the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. And yesterday, I talked about the right way to quit a job. But I realize a lot of people are trying to find the right jobs right now. I'm going to tell you where the greatest needs are both with and without a college degree. Also, the shoplifting thing is becoming something that is becoming a real hassle for the overwhelming percent of us that are honest. And I want to talk about why the shoplifting thing is interfering in your and my life now as honest people. There are some ways that retailers are trying to stop shoplifting that are just terrible for you and me as everyday earthlings. But right now, I want to talk about the job market that regardless of what happens with the economic cycle, there are some patterns that are clear as could be with the job market. And number one, when you look at the data for uh, jobs that do not require a college degree, but require some level of training, apprenticeship, technical college, whatever, the number of openings that there are, as you look year after year, are just mind-blowing. Electricians is one that's been written about a lot recently. And I, I talked about a friend of my son's who's an apprentice who's earning 80 grand a year as an apprentice. I mean, this is great stuff because the shortage of electricians is so extreme in the United States. But it's not just electricians. Think of any service work kind of job for business or home. Heating and air conditioning contractors, plumbers, uh, just two examples of fields that require specific training and education and on-the-job experience, but have good glide paths for income while you're learning, you're earning, And then once you're in, you're in great shape. I talked before about how auto mechanics are in severe shortage because it's a field that the average age of the worker, and this is, by the way, this is true of all these service industry jobs. The average age of the workers has gotten so old because for whatever reason, these jobs have not struck a chord with people that are younger. So people that are coming up in high school, in their late teens, and their 20s, these are all examples of fields that are non-college that have wonderful, wonderful earning opportunities. Now, what's the downside of any of these service job professions where you are working either in a commercial environment or a residential or a blend of both. And I'm sorry for all the ones I didn't mention. The idea is to talk about and get you thinking about these kind of jobs. And as you are at a red light and you see vehicles going by that are various kind of service jobs, and you think, hey, that's something I might be interested in. I'd be willing to get some training for that or do an apprenticeship for that or go to a technical college for that. And then see what it's like for the job opportunities in that. These these are real future paths for you. But let's go to the other side, the college side. There's a new chart out that shows who's making the most money coming out of what colleges. And what is so clear as you look through the list is over and over and over again, they are universities with high percents of STEM graduates. Science, technology, engineering, math. That we are in an economy where if you have an aptitude for these things, the the advantage is overwhelming. Now, there are elite schools that people come out of 
Think of the IVs that people come out of, and they generally will earn very good early and lifetime income. But when you look at the overall education environment, overwhelmingly, there are the degree programs that people come out with in the science technology fields that are where the real money is made with a college degree. Not everything in life is about money. Let me make that clear. But so much of the diss about college today is that, hey, I paid all this money to go, now I got all these student loans, and look what I have to show for it in the job market. So today, it's a show me kind of thing. How do you earn that money? And so it is something that the type of degree you get matters so very much for what income you're going to be able to generate. And that's just a fact for me, doing a STEM degree. (laughs) Oh, man. Speak of people who would be, all right, let's take both categories. Okay, so if I became an electrician, I'd probably electrocute myself. (laughs) If I became a plumber, I'd probably cause leaks in every house or business I tried to repair. Um, Heating and air conditioning, it wouldn't work. I mean, you take one after another. I'm just, there are people who have, who know themselves pretty well. It's like when I was 25 and I decided I wanted to become a private pilot. You know, I didn't want to become a commercial pilot, but I wanted to be a private pilot. After my second lesson, I got back on the ground and I said to the instructor, I said, I know you're probably a great instructor. I will never be a good pilot. And all I'm going to do is kill myself and whoever I'm with. I knew I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So the STEM thing with the college stuff, no way. I would have washed right out of the program. Forget forget uh, getting a good job doing it because we all have our things. But if you have a natural affinity for any of these things, I can tell you they're great career paths, non-college, technical college, or university. Okay, Sean in New York says, I live in Brooklyn and I don't drive usually, but will be renting a car in April down south. I no longer have my Sapphire card with primary auto insurance. Is a credit card with secondary sufficient even though I don't have other car insurance or should I buy from the agency? So neither and neither. You know, a lot of people in uh, New York State, in the New York metro area, Boston metro area, San Francisco, Washington, D.C., don't own vehicles anymore. And so you have to buy a product, if you are going to rent cars, called non-auto owner's insurance. And it's very common in metro areas or states where a large number of people do not own a registered automobile. And the coverage covers you in the rental vehicle as if you were driving your own. If you um, rely on the coverage you have that you would buy at a rental car counter or that you would get from a credit card and you have no traditional auto insurance, the risks on the liability side are the real risk. You know, it's not the damage to a vehicle that you cause in a rental car. It's the damage to people that is where the real expense is. And that's why you should check for non-auto owner's insurance. Mike in Virginia says, Clark, my parents are in their late 60s, and after 40-plus years of marriage, they're getting a divorce. They live in Texas, and as a means of splitting their financials, my father wants to remain in their house, but is looking for an investor so he can give my mom her half of their home value. I was asked if I would be interested in purchasing half of the home. The home would be under my name and my father's, but would not create any residual income. They live outside of Austin, and I feel the market is strong there, and the home value will only increase substantially over the next 10 to 15 years. Mixing business and family is tricky, though. Any suggestions? Uh, So a few things here. One, uh, we've talked about this trend with uh, people in long-term marriages later in life 
getting divorced. And it does create a number of financial issues and is often very upsetting to their adult children. And it's just, it is part of modern life. And I'm sorry that you're experiencing it with your parents. Um, I want to make sure that your mom is okay with this idea because we have human feelings involved in this as well. Does she feel okay with this being the way for her to get her cash out of the home for you to be um, an owner of the home along with your dad? Second, you will need to find a real estate attorney, not a general practice attorney, but a real estate attorney in the state of Texas and talk to him or her through the issues of what would happen in the event that your dad later needed nursing care and would be using the Medicaid program, would that put your equity in that property at risk? And the real estate attorney, if you can deal with the various issues that might be involved, the real estate attorney would be the one who would draw up a proper contract because you are mixing family and money and there should be a written understanding about how things will work, what point you might buy out your dad's half from him. Uh, would you want to own a home living in Virginia that's uh, halfway across the country in Texas? There are things to think about, and think this through. As for Austin, Austin has had a big run-up in value. When a market t tends to have a big run-up in value in housing costs, in a relatively short period of time, it tends to go through a period, a significant period of lagging returns. If that's going to happen in Austin, hard to say, but historically, that's how things work, is what's called reversion to mean. And so you can't count on values of real estate in Austin, single family homes, continuing to rise in the future as they have so radically in the last few years. So you got some homework to do. This is from Adam in Florida. I'm a longtime fan and Clark Stinks contributor, but today I'm writing with a piece of advice for your listeners and a bit of a success story of my own. The advice, the public service loan forgiveness program is alive and rejuvenated. This week I received a letter from my student loan servicer that my six figure federal loan has been forgiven and I now have a zero balance. The tweaks to the program made by the last two administrations has eliminated many old headaches. And one small silver lining of the pandemic is the benefit realized by student loan borrowers, especially those in the PSLF program. I don't feel ashamed or guilty because I paid my student loans for y many years. I'm 52 and have worked as an attorney for the Department of Homeland Security for more than 20 years. My advice to anyone who has second thoughts about taking advantage of the PSLF program is to not hesitate any longer. 10 years of timely payments will get you out from under a huge debt. Like with any government program, it just takes patience and persistence. And, and the program, as you said so clearly, Adam, has been through proper reform. So it actually works for teachers, police officers, firefighters, government workers of various levels, people who work for nonprofits, your case working for Department of Homeland Security, keeping us safe from uh, threats, typically of foreign actors or could be domestic. But uh, I appreciate the work that people do who go into a career path where they earn less than they could in the private sector. And that's why the, the public service loan forgiveness program exists. Whether you agree with it or not, the idea is that people who choose to go into a public service category job, if they make their loan payments on time for 120 straight months, the remaining balance of their loans or to be forgiven tax-free, at least at federal tax. So the program has been non-functional for a long time, now is working. And as I said, with the reforms that went in place, if you long since got discouraged and gave up, get back in the game. Christy uses an expression, when you got knocked down, put your mouthpiece back mm -hmm. in. Get back in the ring. Yeah. yeah. So you got to do that in this case if you have in good faith, paid on those loans, and you've had trouble at every turn trying to get the loan forgiveness that you were promised, 
now it is happening. And thank you for posting that. And most especially, thank you for being a regular contributor to Clark Stinks at clark.com slash Clark Stinks, which we have coming up tomorrow. tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, coming up ahead, though, we're going to talk about the shoplifting craze going on in the United States and how it's driving you and me to distraction what the criminals are doing, the after effects of that. Shoplifting, depending on what part of it you're looking at, has stabilized or gotten much worse. And the things that have improved is there was a time period um, after retailers really started seeing customers again that the stores faced an Armageddon of all different types of internal theft, which is uh, what they call shrink, which is where you have dishonest employees that are stealing, uh, customers that are one-offs, that somebody steals this, that, or the other. And that criminal activity, pretty much from both retailers reporting themselves and from uh, experts in uh, shrink prevention or shoplifting, all report that the run-of-the-mill traditional shoplifting has really settled back down and is not the issue it had spiked to. It's like a lot of the, the crime that spiked during COVID that has settled uh, down in many ways in a lot of the country. It kind of happened the same thing with nonviolent, with shoplifting and internal theft. But what has come about that is why you and I are being inconvenienced so much is organized criminal rings that are highly organized at stealing items things that like i saw one of the stories i saw okay listen to one of the items that crooks are stealing i would never if i was if i was a professional criminal i don't have criminal mind thank goodness but if i was i would never say you know what i think i want to steal today is shaving cream shaving cream I mean, I spend a dollar twenty-five for my shaving cream. It used to be a dollar, but you know now it's dollar twenty-five. I mean, are you going to steal that? They're they're not even small things, but apparently they're very easy to sell, and that's the key: is that criminals are looking for items, especially health and beauty. And I shared with you last summer about how retailers are starting to lock up their health and beauty stuff, and you got to go find somebody to come with the special key that somebody's got to have to unlock and give you, and they many of them have dispensers where even if employees opened it, it will only pop out one of that item at a time. And then I was in a Walmart in New Jersey that was buying something in the health and beauty section, and they had it cordoned off had a gate, you had to enter a gate to leave, and it was a tall gate, and there was a separate cashier, and anything you were getting in there, you had to go through that. And then in that case, the cashier, one cashier took forever to get things because the cashier would have to close the register, go unlock something for you to be able to get it because most of the items in this cordoned off health and beauty area were in these lockup cabinets. Oh my goodness. So you and I, as everyday people, it's that old rule that in business, 99% of people suffer for the 1% who aren't doing what they're supposed to do. It's just, just a fact of law, Murphy's Law kind of thing. Now, retailers are starting to use that creepy Chinese surveillance kind of stuff where they're using facial recognition. And you may see this at a retailer um, at the returns desk. And what they're looking for is they're looking for the same face showing up over and over again, trying to return merchandise. Way beyond what that individual may be doing buying things. And so... This is the facial recognition developed um, overseas is so sophisticated now that it can um, draw 
clear patterns of who people are. And you'll see now, I don't know if you've seen this before, where they tell you you have to take your hat and sunglasses off at the returns. It's for the facial recognition software. So you are treated now as guilty till proven innocent by many retailers for the returns. Now, like anything else, retailers will get this under control. The unfortunate part in between is the innocent are being inconvenienced because of what the criminal gangs are doing. And it is a hassle and is just terrible. And by the way, that was not a knock on the Chinese people. It's that the Chinese government, Krista, is so into surveillance, spying on their own people. Okay, Alan in North Carolina says, I just wanted to share, I received my large Equifax data breach settlement, a whopping, are you ready? I'm ready. $5.21. Great payday for completing the forms. You know, the Equifax data breach goes down as something that people that are cynical about capitalism can have their cynicism reinforced because Equifax had the worst data breach in the history of modern times, caused so much harm to half of American adults that will continue to suffer the repercussions of brutal identity thefts for, could be decades to come, and they got a tiny slap on the wrist. It just, it was outrageous and so unfortunate, and nothing much has changed in how credit reporting works. And it's very frustrating and upsetting for me. And I think the greatest video I ever produced was when I was standing in front of the Equifax headquarters after the data breach became known that they had tried to keep secret. That's right. I had a little bit of rage that day. You did. I'm not normally somebody filled with rage. No, you definitely did. I was holding the uh, phone camera, so... Remember that. Russ in Connecticut says, on a recent show, there was a discussion about fraudulent emails and being cautious. Krista mentioned a fake email from PayPal as an example. A fake email from PayPal isn't the only concern. I received an email from PayPal indicating a pending invoice waiting my approval. I logged into PayPal to discover there actually was a pending invoice from someone I didn't know for an amount of several hundred dollars. Really? There is no process in PayPal that I could find for to dispute or cancel the invoice. So I was careful not to approve it, and several days, maybe weeks later, it disappeared. This happened a second time with the same result. So it isn't only that you can receive a fake email that's supposed to be from PayPal, you can also receive a real one with a fake invoice. Okay, that is very disturbing, particularly for small businesses that don't have good procedures in place to audit invoices that they're receiving. Hmm. How'd you feel about contacting PayPal and see if there is a procedure that just wasn't obvious yeah, to Russ? we'll have to do that. But it's good that it was deleted eventually. I mean, the, the important thing is you always look at everything that is sent to you in PayPal. But it's, you're right. It's a complete wrinkle, could. Russ. I mean, it's a complete wrinkle different than what I usually talk about, which is in this case, the email was a legitimate one, but what it led you to, the invoices were fake. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are invoices. Somebody just might have an email list and they just email a bunch of people invoices through PayPal. So, wow. Russ, thank you for do. the heads up. We're going to follow up and see if there is any procedure, I mean, if it's happened to you, it's happening to others, that if PayPal's not aware of it, they need to be, and they need to do something to protect their customer base. And from Logan in Texas, hi, Clark, my employer is offering voluntary long-term care insurance starting in April. Is this something I should be looking into buying? And if so, is my employer the right place to purchase the coverage? So the advantage of buying long-term care insurance through an employer is in theory it should be at a lower premium than it would be elsewhere. Don't know, and you won't know till you look into it, if you have to go through what's called medical underwriting, which is where they evaluate your current medical health and decide whether or not you are risk-worthy. If it is all comers, it's weirdly potentially more expensive to buy through an employer than buy on your own because... There's what's called adverse selection, that people who know they've got health problems buy it. People who don't 
don't buy it, and it puts extra risk on the insurer. Um, second thing is how old are you? The key good window to buy long-term care insurance stays the same as it's been for decades. That is late 50s to early 60s. Buying it younger is not necessarily the greatest idea. Uh, the other thing is you need to read in the offering from the employer how premiums are established each year and what premium increases you'd be subject to over the years. The big complaints we've had about long-term care insurance, somebody may pay on it for many years, and then when you get closer and closer when you're going to use it, the premiums skyrocket, and you end up having to abandon the policy because you can no longer afford it. So, gosh, I gave you a lot of homework there when you were just looking for Clark. Yes or no? But long-term care insurance is one of those things that you get buried in the details, but it's important to get buried in those details instead of just making a quick yes or no decision. And I want to tell you, I hope you enjoy our podcast. And wherever you listen, I hope you'll consider subscribing to it. Or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you prefer watching the video version. And your ratings, your reviews help us reach more people. And if you already subscribe, I want to tell you I appreciate you. And I hope you continue wanting to listen and watch. Have a great day.